Hello. Good afternoon. How is everyone? Uh, we're very happy to be here today at SCAD. Um, Tracy, I th I'm sure everyone in here wears jeans or at least has a pair of jeans. I hope so. And, yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of, uh, Tracy's going to show you a lot of interesting images from jeans dating back from 1890s. So, and after that, we're going to have questions. Please feel free, ask anything you want. So uh, let's get into it. Well, maybe I will begin by talking about, uh, since I'm the historian, uh, I'll just begin by a little recap of the company's history. The, uh, the company, actually in recent weeks, I've referred to Levi Strauss as the 166-year-old startup. And the reason for that is we're San Francisco born, uh, a stone's throw away from Silicon Valley, and just uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in New York at the New York Stock Exchange because the company went public for the second time in its history. So we're a startup, just with a little longer history than uh, the Lyfts or the other companies that you'll see. Uh, and uh, uh, Mobilaji, the, the company dates to the gold rush era, 1850s. Oh. It, it starts with Levi Strauss, uh, the founder, uh, who was an immigrant to America from uh, Bavaria, Germany. And he came to, uh, to America in the 1840s, uh, first to New York. He had a couple of brothers there that had a dry goods uh, business, and then heard about the gold rush and during the gold rush, decided to expand the company's business. So went to the, uh, moved to San Francisco in 1853 and uh, began his business. And in the first 10 to 20 years, he became very successful uh, and a well-known philanthropist in the city. But the company's history changed in the 1870s. Uh, before that, uh, Levi Strauss was doing a lot of importing and exporting, no manufacturing at all. But Levi received a letter in 1872 from one of his customers. He was a tailor in Reno, Nevada, who'd come up with an unusual idea. And the idea was that you take a pair of, uh, of work pants, and in the pockets, you add tiny copper rivets. And if you do that, you're going to make pants that don't tear, uh, and they will last longer, especially for working men like, uh, like these guys. So the earliest wearers were, uh, were miners, cowboys, railroad engineers, farmers, hunters, any, uh, anyone who needed tough work pants. And they, they were made, uh, they were made for, for men. And uh, it was this start for the first 50 years, it was these working men's pants that the, uh, the company began its, its work wear uh, line in, and uh, eventually adding jackets that were riveted to its blue jeans. So before, just to be straight, before 1970, I mean, sorry, 1873, they were making jeans without rivets, or? Right, so what happens is uh, he gets a, Levi gets this letter from this tailor in Reno, Nevada. It's 1872. He orders more materials, and at the same time, he tells him about this unusual way of, of riveting pockets and asks Levi if he wants to take a patent out for the process. Uh, Levi agrees, and uh, the patent is granted on May 20th, 1873, uh, the day that we refer to at the company as the birth of blue jeans. And uh, we always have a celebration at Levi Strauss and Company. It's, it's a global one. So last year I was in China uh, and, and I've been in Barcelona for it. But that's when we celebrate it. And in four years from now, 2023, we will celebrate the 150th anniversary wow. of Blue Jeans. So they've been around a long time. Yeah. Uh, let me, uh, should we talk about customization and? Yeah. Yeah. These are, these are from 1890s, I believe. These no? are from 1890s. So what you're looking at here is a pair of, one of the oldest pairs of blue jeans in the world. And you might, uh, your reaction, at least this, this was uh, a lot of people who see them, they look pretty much like today's. There's some differences, but they aren't a whole lot. There's not a whole lot of changes. Uh, you'll notice that there's just a single pocket back here. There's a little, uh, a little cinch uh, 
uh, and these were called waste overalls. But, but what uh, began to happen very early in uh, the history of the people who were wearing their products is they began to customize them, make them personal. And the first personalizations were practical. So in this case, the case of this pair from 1890, which are, uh, the name of these is Spur Bites, and you might be able to guess why they're called Spur Bites. They have tears at the bottom of the hem, uh, created by a pair of spurs. And the back side was uh, patched up, because this was a cowboy's, and he was sitting on a saddle all day, and needed to have the, that patching in order to, to make his, uh, his blue jeans last. And then in another one, uh, this patch on the right front thigh, most likely because this cowboy was holding his reins on the right side of his pants. So personalization <coughs> happening very early on. So at this, at this time, were they just making one style of jeans or were they making different styles of jeans? Just the one. Okay. Uh, in fact, they weren't even called jeans then. They were called the waist, waist overalls because they sat at your waist and you could pull them up over your long underwear or your, or your, long, or your pants uh, okay. and wear them as a protective overcoat. Okay. Yeah. So it was more wearing it over something else? It instead was. Instead of wearing it by itself? Overalls. Okay. Yeah. And that's what we called them up until, up until the 60s. Okay. Yeah. Uh, should we take a look at another one? Yep. Uh, another example of customization. This one, uh, a, a pair of 501s from 1917. Uh, these were purchased by a man named Homer Campbell. He lived in Arizona, Wickenburg, Arizona, and he was a hard rock miner. Uh, he bought his pants, his 501s, in 1917, wore them every day for three years, except Sunday. Okay. <laughs> and uh, he patched them up. You can see on the front side just how, how much they've been patched. That's a lot of work in three years. That's a lot of work, yeah. yes. And uh, my favorite personalization is this on the back right side. We know Homer was right-handed because he added a tool pocket on the back right side so he could put tools in there and then grab them out very easily. This is, this is pretty fascinating to me. How, did, how does Levi's acquire? A pair of jeans like this. Yes, yeah, so like. the story about this one is uh, back in the day, we had a guarantee. Uh, our, our pants were so strong. In fact, we had a trademark with two horses and a pair of pants in the middle. They're so strong that if you try to pull them apart, they won't rip. Uh, but if they do rip, we will offer you a new pair. Uh, we have this one because Homer wrote and sent the pants back and said, I'm disappointed they haven't lasted as long as I expected. Could you send me a new pair? Mm. Uh, we did, but we kept this pair. Uh, <laughs> How did been... <laughs> Homer feel about keeping his old pair? <laughs> well, that was proof he believed that he needed a, a new one. So okay. we were uh, happy to send him a new pair, and they've been in our collection since 1920. Yeah. Are they like in a glass case or something? They are. So our most important pieces are kept in a fireproof safe. Mm. Uh, others are kept in uh, museum quality boxes, acid free, uh, in, in plain muslin. And we, uh, we handle these, these earliest ones with gloves. And this part here is on the back, on the it right side? It is the back right side of the, uh, of the jean. Yeah. So you can see that there. Nice. Yeah. The next one is interesting, Phyllis. Yeah. Uh, now we get into the Depression. Okay. So another example of a different kind of a personalization. The Depression, late 1920s, just in case. Right? That's right. Uh, Wall Street <laughs> uh, falls in, uh, in 29, and then you have the Depression. This is an era when families are scraping and scrimping to get by. And purchasing new clothes for many families is just not an option. Yeah. And uh, in this case, uh, Phyllis Starkey was the daughter of the, uh, one of two children of the Starkey family. She uh, and her family moved from Minnesota to Arizona uh, during the Depression. And it was during that era that her mother either went to a thrift shop or her, her parents either went to a thrift shop or got a hand-me-down, uh, this jacket. And uh, her mother personalized it, added her name in the top, and then did something kind of unusual. Uh, Phyllis was uh, beautiful. She became a model later in life. Here she is. She was very tall and she had long arms. So long, in fact, that the, uh, the customization her mother did for her was add this little extra bit of uh, fabric to lengthen the sleeves. So again, practical, 
but still important. And, and I think what's great about this uh, mobilogy is it's also a, an example of how beloved garments can become. Yeah. Um, Phyllis lived to be in her 90s. She kept wow. this jacket up until she had to move into a nursing home and then donated it to our collection. Wow. Yeah. I too am a Levi's freak. I only wear Levi's. And my dry cleaner won't. He actually gets mad when I bring them because it's, I get them patched up. He refuses to patch them up because he doesn't understand why. So I, I totally understand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I'm a nice. Levi's. I'm part of the Levi's cult. And I, yeah, yeah. and I like your, your, your Levi's you're wearing as well. Yeah. I have Levi's that, that are too small for me. I have them in my storage. Uh, so like Phyllis, you want to keep yeah. that. Yeah, maybe so, till you're not. So maybe I should send them to you. <laughs> we get some of they our things for donations. They got patches on them. They have patches on yeah. them. Yeah, we'll, we'll yeah. take it. Okay. Yeah. Are you going to yeah. send me some other Levi's? <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> A new pair free. <laughs> okay. Uh, this one is from World War II actually, and uh, this is an era when we start to see a little bit of a, of a, <clears throat> a blend between practical customization. Uh, this is a jacket, it's, of course it's been well, <clears throat> excuse me, well worn, but the lining was added, so that beautiful plaid lining was added by the owner, uh, added a little bit of extra weight, uh, and because you were also in this era not buying uh, a lot of new clothes, you could have the the added extra, um, maybe for warmth. But what's unique about this one, and a favorite of our designers at Levi Strauss and Company, is that there is a unique customization on the back. Can you make out what's on, what's on the back there? That stitching? It's a heart. It is a heart. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not about practicality there. That's mm. really about, about creating a, mm. a style. Yeah. Do, do you know who owned it? Was it like a gift? Someone... Don't know the, the backstory of this one. Just know that the customization. Uh, this one also has uh, holes in the collar, so probably worn with pins, uh, but as early as the 40s. Yeah, nice. so World War II. Should we talk about what happened after World War II and some of the customization then? <laughs> is this, a, a, these are biker vests, right? It is. Yeah. yeah. So uh, World War II, of course, is a very important event in American history. Many American soldiers went abroad, and when they weren't in their uniforms, they wore Levi's 501 jeans. And when they came back, a lot of soldiers wanted to still have that sense of brotherhood yeah. and uh, created, uh, started adopting a bike culture. Um, writing Harley Davidsons. In fact, Har uh, Hell's Angels would, was started in uh, California, uh, Oakland, California, San Francisco Bay Area, as well as uh, Southern California. And this is an example of a biker jacket. It was owned by a former Hell's Angel member. And uh, you can see it's pretty dirty, uh, actually very crusty, so the dirtier the better in this case. Mm. But the personalization here is really about expressing your affiliation with the club. So you're going to see the club insignia here. What, what, uh, what era is this from? 60s? Uh, yeah, or maybe a little bit later, because this okay. guy went to Sturgis. Uh, 77. Yeah. Okay. And uh, you can see the, the Hells Angel patch there on the bottom. And something unique about this jacket is the way uh, and the cuts that are, in the, that are in the sleeves. So if you are a biker member, you have to earn the cuts. And they are cut off with a knife. So you're going to get that really rough edge. And this jacket was not only uh, was worn by somebody who was pretty tough, but the, uh, the owner also had to earn the cuts on the collar. Uh, so uh, a, pretty, a pretty rough uh, bike member. But this is an example, again, of personalization. So you've shifted from that, that very practical wear to... Uh, expressing affiliation and that that club culture. It's cool. Yeah. Then we get into the 60s, where things really change and personalization just starts to blossom. Free, 19. Free expression. Free expression, right? And blue jeans become a canvas yeah. for expressing that. Uh, this is a pair of 505 Levi's jeans from 1967. 67 was the summer of love. It was the year uh, that... Woodstock? 
uh, a couple years before Woodstock, yeah, 67. 67. Okay. It's when hundreds of youth were coming into San Francisco and they were using blue jeans. Uh, blue jeans became a very popular, it became their garment of choice in many cases because they were cheap, you could get them at thrift stores, or in some cases you could buy them at places in the hate like the Diggers. And the Diggers was a place where you could go drop off things and then you could pick others up for free. Yeah. And uh, what was very popular to do was to take, cut open the side seam and to add a piece of fabric and to create your own boot cut jeans because you wanted to add not only style but the, practic the practicality of being able to wear boots yeah. with your jeans. This is where it kind of started. And the story about boot cut is that uh, uh, an owner of a boutique in San Francisco, uh, the name of the boutique was Menasadika. She was styling a number of people, like Janis Joplin, who were living in the hate. And they were creating bootcut jeans. And uh, she went to the manager of the Levi Strauss plant and said, this is a really popular silhouette. You really ought to create it. And two years later, uh, Levi Strauss introduced the first bootcut and bell-bottom jean style. So 50 years this year. Uh, which is this year the 50th anniversary of Woodstock and uh, 1969. Yep. Guess what him, uh, Jimi Hendrix was wearing when he was playing Star Spangled Banner? <laughs> bell bottoms, and he was wearing, <laughs> yes, his wow. bell bottoms. Uh, but that trend kind of started there. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Let's move on to the. And again, customization, and uh, this one uh, kind of unique. So in 67 was a time when hundreds of people are coming, and one of the people to come to San Francisco was a young woman. She was, uh, her name was Melody Sabatasso. She was attending design school at FIT in New York, and uh, she decided to drop out and head to the West Coast to be part of the Summer of Love movement. She got there and she was invited to a wedding. She didn't have anything to wear. All she had was a closet full of Levi's, her favorite jeans. So she cut them up, put them together in a new way, created a dress, and uh, she got such rave reviews at the wedding that her friends started asking her to make them, uh, their outfits, uh, and she was doing things like this. And uh, one of her outfits was spotted by the actress Lauren Bacall, who commissioned her to do a piece. And it kick-started her career, and uh, it was the beginning of a very uh, long relationship with Levi's, mm. and she still does uh, pieces today. Yep. Here's it's another beautiful. one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this one uh, from 1970, and by a guy uh, named Doug. This is Doug, and uh, see if you can find Doug's name on the pants somewhere. Um, so Doug moved to California from the East Coast, he was living in Maryland, and he moved to California in 1970, and he was so disappointed that he'd just missed the summer of love that he bought a pair of 501 jeans from a farmer in central California. They were just beginning to tear, and so he started covering them with patches. His grandmother had a vintage tie collection, so he started adding those, and then his then-girlfriend, uh, now wife, here she is, uh, also had a floral fabric collection, and he started adding those as well. And then uh, he did what was very popular that we've just talked about, opened up that side seam, oh, added a little of extra fabric, and created his, his boot cut jeans. That was a beautiful. Yeah. Uh, you probably, and those of you uh, who are here at SCAD will appreciate the fact that uh, Doug was very artistic. He actually studied at Fresno State University graphic illustration, and today he is a professor at Fresno State University teaching graphic illustration, and he does children's books. Yeah, nice. illustrates those children's books. Yeah. By the way, there's his name, in case you missed it. Duh. <laughs> Another very popular thing to do uh, was to take your Levi's uh, in the 60s and 70s and to create skirts. So you'd open up the seams and you would sew it together and, uh, and you could create uh, a skirt. Yeah. And that's what this woman did. This is Anna Marie. She's from Queens in New York, and she did that. Uh, she's wearing one of her, her Levi's skirts. But she also did something kind of unique. 
on the pocket. She put her glasses on there. <laughs> That's right. So uh, guess what Anna Marie wore? Uh, she wore glasses. And she wanted to dispel the myth that girls who, wore, who wear glasses can't have fun. And so she <laughs> embroidered glasses. This became her signature on her Levi's. Her and glasses. we have a pair of these here. Yeah. We're we'll going to see at that those. later. Yeah. yeah, Anna Marie's. Yeah. Should we talk about this yeah. one? <laughs> this person had a lot of time on their hands. And, yeah. And she's going to tell you why. <laughs> uh, this person did. So these are a pair yeah. of white stay-pressed Levi's jeans from 1979. They were owned by a former prison inmate. Uh, he was uh, incarcerated in a Northern mm -hmm. California prison. He had plenty of time on his hands, Mobilaji. <laughs> 30 years. Wow. He was incarcerated for 30 years, and during that time, he illustrated on every inch of them. So here, much more an expression of psychology, I think. Um, in Do you know how these were acquired? Yes, because I'm the one that got them. So I'll tell you the story. It's, yeah. it's an interesting story. I'm curious, because so, <laughs> he's got a lot of different emotion over the 30 years. He does. So the story wow. is that uh, this... Uh, convict. He was released about 2012, 2013. He, uh, out of a Northern California prison, he's in San Diego and he's at a poker hall. And outside of a poker hall, he's got a guitar and he tries to sell it to a guy. And uh, the guy uh, is not interested in his, his guitar, but he sees this pair of pants hanging out of the guitar case. And he says, I'll buy the pants from you. Uh, that guy got in touch with us. And uh, so I acquired them from him. I don't have contact with, with the prisoner, but aren't they amazing? It's amazing. Yeah. There's a guitar there, too. Yeah. Lots of things. You'll see do you lots know, of Do things. you know what he used? He to... used uh, Sharpie. You'll see different colors on here, a number yeah. of pens. So ballpoint, marker, different color here. Uh, yeah. Never actually wore these. These were just a canvas for him to draw on. Yeah. Wow. So we call these the prison pants. A lot of time. And uh, speaking of drawing or writing on your pants, uh, this is another pair. But you, uh, unless you s can recognize Swedish, you're not going to be able to uh, translate this. And uh, an example of Levi's and the phenomenon of, of personalizing and customizing your jeans was happening all over the world, not just in America. Uh, this is a pair from Sweden. They were owned by a woman named Debbie who uh, had her friends sign her jeans before she left for America. So you'll see things all over. And uh, a couple of years ago, I had to go to Stockholm. And so I had our uh, PR team uh, translate. And I'll, I'll tell you what this says here. <laughs> so the translation is, what are weddings without bridesmaids? What is heaven without stars? And what is Kumla without Debbie? So Debbie came from a place called Kumla in Sweden, and that was her, uh, the goodbye poem from her friend. So beautiful, so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, the idea of, of writing on your jeans, having your friends sign them, yeah. it's, it still happens. Um, even decades later, the, uh, I love the album by Lauryn Hill, her Miseducation yeah. album, and in, in the song, Every Ghetto, Every City, she talks about writing friends' names jeans, on jeans yeah. with a marker. Yeah. Yeah. What do you think about this piece? A lot of time, but maybe they weren't in jail. <laughs> uh, customizing uh, the jeans were, was so popular that we actually had at Levi's a denim art contest in 1972, and we invited submissions. And this is one of the winning submissions. And it was a guy from Brooklyn, New York, his name was Hopeton Morris, and he took hair color samples and Coca-Cola bottle caps. So this is human hair or I don't know what hair, hair color samples okay. are made of, <laughs> but that's what he used. So uh, you get all those. And what's great about it is, is when you wear it, it moves. <laughs> uh, we, we call this hair, so it's one of the winning, winning pieces. What, what year is this from again? 72 is when we had 72. the contest. And 73, the winning pieces were selected to tour museums across the United States and select countries in Europe. Yeah. Does Levi still have contests like this? 
Uh, we, we do occasionally, and uh, sometimes uh, there we have contests not only to uh, share art, but also to raise funds, uh, as you'll see in just a minute. Here's another example of a winning, uh, of a winning pair of Levi's with a political <coughs> theme. Uh, Watergate was happening in 72, and these are the Watergate pants. A pair of oversized Levi's. They're really clown pants, if you will, and uh, some of the figures from the Watergate scandal, which brought President Nixon's, uh, brought his presidency down. And that's Barbara Orsini, who crafted these. The, uh, these are obviously like protest jeans. Did anyone ever wear these, or were they just no. like a... Uh, just a piece of political expression. We still have it in, in the collection, and it was on display last year at the Dion Museum in San Francisco uh, for, in 2017 for the Summer of Love exhibition. Punk. Punk. And we'll go through maybe some of these pretty, uh, pretty quickly. Uh, uh, also examples of expression. This one, musical taste. Uh, this is a punk vest that was owned by a, a, a fan in Texas. And he, uh, he took a jacket just like mine, of course it was blue denim, cut off the sleeves, he bleached, and you can see some of the bleaching here, the blue denim, and then he added, he uh, overdyed it black, uh, added those studs, and then cut up his t-shirts from his favorite bands and added them to his, uh, his jacket, uh, his vest, including the back, which is the, the most important part of the real estate, mm -hmm. his favorite band, the Partisans from the UK. Yeah. What is that uh, leopard piece? Is that at the bottom? Do you know? So very common in, in punk to have some kind of an animal print yeah. theme. And then on the bottom, something that has a military, uh, military roots. These two rings that were used to, add, used to add a little extra piece of fabric. And during World War I, when soldiers were fighting in trenches, uh, that bum flap, as it's called, was used for them to sit on. So some military um, connections there as well yep. in that customization. Nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you might be able to guess from some of these pop culture references what era yeah. this is. Anybody want to just call out the, uh, this piece, what era this might be from? Yeah. This is 90s. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, so Beavis and, and Butthead, and, and look, something that's now kind of passe, even CDs. <laughs> Uh, Michael Jordan. This is a pair of silver tab Levi's that have been customized by a guy who, who, uh, who captured the pop art culture of the 90s. This was some of our first street, uh, street wear, loose silver tab jeans, and a, uh, a contrast to these Levi's from the 1970s. This is a pair of 501s owned by a surfer. They were customized and really became a scrapbook of his favorite locations that he would go surfing. And you can see this back patch where he was at Myrtle Beach, he went to Australia, Hawaii, and they're faded because they've been sitting out in the sun or in the ocean. Okay. This must be from 1994, I think. You think? Yeah, because if he's going for four, that means that he won okay. three championships. Okay, there we go. These are historical I... 90s jeans, <laughs> yeah. 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 90s Levi's, and I think, I think there's, uh, so uh, you might recognize that signature there. Uh, this is an example of customization for a cause. This was uh, Elton John, 1994, part of uh, DIFA, the uh, Design Industry Foundation Fighting AIDS, uh, creation that was auctioned off to raise money for uh, AIDS research. The details yeah. are amazing on this one. Yeah. Yeah, really, and uh, very personal for, for Elton. Can't you just see him wearing, wearing that? Is this vest sewed into it, or is it just it uh, is. accessory? On? Oh, it is. Yep, it is. Yeah. And, uh, and maybe we'll end uh, at least the pictures with, with this one. Yeah. Uh, if you were a fan of all boy bands in the early 2000s, maybe some of you are too young, yeah. you might uh, recognize this uh, that would have been worn uh, by a band member of InSync. Anyone know? LB. Lance Bass. Lance Bass. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so uh, the funny thing about this is uh, Justin Timberlake was, was in visiting. I was showing him in the archives and I wanted to show him this piece. And he was very funny. He was very shy, a little bit embarrassed. At, he wore that? <laughs> <laughs> at how glittery it was. But he explained that his stylist, his good friend uh, who's still with him, Trace, uh, that they would get on the bus for tours and they literally had something like a bedazzler. Yikes. Um, 
<laughs> creating those. So those are is the chaps that he wore, and each of the band members had a unique uh, outfit. I think there was a uh, Justin Brittany moment in this time. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Similar to this, I think. Yeah. yeah. In fact, maybe we should, should yeah. we take a look? Let's talk about it. <laughs> Your gloves. She has to get gloves. I, I put them yeah. over there. Yeah, okay. let's let's take a look. Beautiful. So we brought a few things. I brought a few things from San Francisco, our archives, to share. And uh, yes, if you're a conservator and if you're also trying to take care of the garments, we wear gloves when we handle these. So I'll put these on. So what do you want to look at first, Mobile Does an alarm go off if I touch these? No, no, but I'll hold them. <laughs> Which one? Do you want to start this. with this one? Okay. Yeah. Uh, anyone want to guess who created this? Girls with glasses. Yeah, this is Anna Marie's. Uh, she created three skirts from her Levi's, a mini. This is the mini, and you'll know her because of her signature eyeglasses on the back. She created a midi that she was wearing in the photo, and then she also took her mother's uh, vintage 1950s Levi's and created a maxi, a maxi skirt. So she has all three, uh, and we have all three of those in the archives. Yeah. yeah. And let's see the front. You should show them. So you take the Levi's, you <laughs> wow. open up the seams. <laughs> Yeah, it's a and then you just stitch them up. Too. Yeah. Nice. And these ones, what? Uh... So these ones are an example of how uh, personalization and customization can be used by, can be done by people of all ages. So this pair of Levi's, uh, by a very, a very small woman. What is that? They were. Is the date on there? No, it's a clown. Oh, so uh, the woman that wore these, her name was Grandma George. And uh, she loved doilies. You might be able to spot a doily on this. She loved uh, cross-stitch and embroidery. And she covered her pants in the things that she loved. And then the zipper broke. That's why it's open like this. And she was so upset, she didn't want to get rid of them, and she sent them to us, donated them. So they're part of the collection. Grandma George. And Here's a look at the back. Them. Amazing details. Maybe yeah. the side. You can't really see the side. Yeah. Added that trim there. Yeah. So, uh, 2002. So these the are pretty. Unicorn. Yes. Is a unicorn. There's a unicorn. There's a rose. All the things she loves, and, and the, the doily was on the front. Mm. Should we look at this one? Yeah. Uh, uh, and this uh, halter, this piece, Melody Sabatasso. I told you about the woman who moved to San Francisco in the 19. Yeah, the one for the 67, wedding. 67. The, the wedding. The woman who created the dress. This yeah. is what was one of her signature pieces. So she would take her Levi's jeans and cut them up, deconstruct, and put them back together. And one of her signatures became creating halter. And she would take the waistband of a pair of, of Levi's and then add denim at the top, add Swarovski crystals, and uh, and then she would. This was her signature. And the funny thing about this mobilaji is uh, Levi Strauss, we wrote her a letter and told her to cease and desist uh, taking apart our, our, <laughs> our clothing and putting it back together again. She was just a very young designer, and her mother wrote back and said, quit bothering her. She's just trying to establish her business. I think today, if she were to do that again, we would just say, let's, let's collaborate together. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Is she still around? She's not. She is. She's done. She's, yeah. uh, she does a few things, but she was featured in Rolling Stone magazine. She has uh, outfitted everyone from uh, Elvis Presley to Tanya Tucker in wow. her very unique pieces. And her signature, which you can only see if you flip uh, the underside of her garments in red, Love Melody. That's her design name, Love Melody. So she puts it on all of her pieces. Nice. Yeah. A lot of Levi's love. Yep. Let's go to the other Let's side. Let's go over here. Okay. Where do you want to start? I think these are very interesting. Okay, the let me come so out. Vibrant. I'll come. I'll come around. Uh, this is a recent addition. I love this one. Uh, it's a pair of Levi's 501 jeans, and you know how you can tell it's a pair of 501 jeans by the fly, the button fly, the original. So this is a pair that was created by a fan in Pennsylvania. And what's unique about this, well, you can see what's unique about this, all the embroidery. But look at the symmetry of this, unlike uh, Grandma George's and the other one. And then the, uh, of course, the, the beautiful look. And also, which you can't tell too much, but this person also, he took apart the side seam and created a pair of boot cut. They're just not too big, but he did the same thing. And he added fabric at the bottom. I he think. did. Yeah. 
Yeah, and then you won't be able to see it because of where you're sitting. Uh, you can certainly come up afterward, but he added buttons. He wore this pair with suspenders. <laughs> yeah. It's an interesting detail on the front. Yes. Yes, I'll let that speak for itself. Yeah. So uh, let's talk about this one next. Yeah, this right. is another 501, and what's interesting about this one is that, yeah, yeah, I'll just kind of, <laughs> so this one is a skirt, but rather than sewing it together like Anna Marie did, uh, added a, just fabric and made this very beautiful kind of A-line skirt, uh, but using a vintage piece. So you can mm -hmm. see how creative you can be in, yeah. in customizing it. And this style has stayed pretty popular through the yeah. years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's talk about this one last piece. Anybody a fan of Project Runway? <laughs> I am. <laughs> this is a Project Runway piece. So if you were watching uh, the uh, season four, in the ninth episode, they, have a, they had a 501 challenge. And uh, the designers were given 501s, and this was the winning piece. Was this made from one pair of jeans? They were given several. Okay. Several, and they had to come up with, with something. And you'll notice the, uh, that this was a 501 because of all the buttons uh, from the button fly that was used here. Uh, Ricky Lazaldi was the winner, and this is the, uh, the dress. So all examples of customizing in a very different way uh, over the years. Yeah. Such yeah. a range of customize. It is. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you, Tracy. Yeah, of course. <laughs>